I welcome you to the second year of the RISIS research seminars. You know, we had the first uh, very successful year with uh, nine seminars and uh, more than 350 participants. And therefore, we decided to go on with this experience. And the goal of the seminars is to present research broadly related to research policy in higher education, which is the topic for the uh, RISIS uh, European projects. And uh, I, I, I want to remember that we are still open for proposals for presentations. Uh, there is a program I posted on the chat, and we will announce later the next seminar. But we will still, still have a couple of slots available this year, or this uh, academic year, and uh, the seminar series is planned to continue. So feel free to, to propose uh, uh, presentations uh, on, on this topic. Today, I have the pleasure to welcome Agatha Lambrex. She uh, graduated at the University of York, and she's now at the Institute of Public Communication at the Universidad de la Svizzera Italiana in Lugano, which is my, my own institute. Um, she works on, uh, on a very important topic, which is access to higher education by the uh, more disadvantaged people, in that case, uh, uh, refugees. And we know that, that that's a core topic for uh, uh, European and national higher education policies. And uh, she will help us reflecting uh, uh, on concepts, but also on the needs. And therefore, I have also the pleasure to welcome Franz Kreiser from Perth University of Twente, who is one of major actors also of the EU multi rank project and who was so kind to be willing to comment, uh, uh, especially, I guess, on the data needs uh, and, and future of data on this topic. Uh, so I hand over immediately to Agatha uh, the word for your presentation. Thank you very much. I will uh, attempt to share my screen. Could you let me know if it's working? Yes, perfectly. <laughs> it is. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, apologies for the delay. Uh, thank you all for uh, making it here. Uh, to Benedetto, of course, for uh, inviting me and the France for agreeing to be uh, my discussant. Um, Although the empirical part of my presentation will be based on my uh, now completed doctoral research, uh, my work in this area is still very much in progress, so um, I do sincerely hope uh, to receive some feedback and suggestions uh, from you so I can take this forward in the future. Um, and the plan for my uh, presentation is quite simple. Uh, I will very briefly introduce myself and work to date. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what we know so far about the current state of higher education participation by students with refugee backgrounds in Europe. Um, and I will follow this with a very brief discussion of why universities and society at large should care about access to higher education for refugees and how can we frame these discussions as a matter of internationalization, widening participation, human rights and universities of admissions and uh, international um, and European policies. Um, then I will discuss some uh, potential indicators on refugee integration in higher education um, and some ideas I've had on the potential frameworks for data collection that could be connected with the European level uh, higher education monitoring system, uh, such as Eurodice, um, ETER, or, or MultiRank, uh, represented by France here today. Uh, so very, firstly, uh, very briefly uh, about me, I'm a freshly baked doctor. I've completed my PhD in education. Uh, last uh, autumn, uh, my project was entitled uh, The Neglected Minority, the Higher Education Opportunities for Refugee Background Students in England and Poland. Um, I've published some of my uh, findings from the research, uh, from the doctoral research in uh, uh, an article and findings from uh, a related uh, case about separate case study uh, in a book chapter. And I've worked with my alma mater and other institutions, uh, mainly in the UK, trying to improve practice uh, around recruitment and support uh, for refugee background students. And that included um, 
how universities uh, collect uh, relevant data. And I currently work on uh, the ETER project, the European Tertiary Education Register uh, in Lugano, a project that gathers and makes available um, data, um, amongst other areas, about students and graduates uh, in Europe at an institutional uh, rather than a national level. Uh, so before I move on to discussing the issue of higher education specifically, uh, we need perhaps a little bit of context. I'm not sure about the backgrounds of uh, everyone who is uh, here today. Uh, many of you probably know already uh, that we are living in times of uh, somewhat unprecedented recorded numbers of forced displacement globally. It has doubled in the last 20 years and we are currently at the highest number in the almost in almost 70 year history of the UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency. At the end of 2019, there were almost 80 million displaced people in the world, including 26 million refugees with a recognized status and further 4.2 million asylum seekers, that is refugees who have pending cases awaiting to be recognized by the uh, host country. My own research focused uh, on those who sought protection and better lives in Europe, although, of course, the majority, uh, some 85% of world's refugees are hosted in the so-called developing countries, uh, with 73% staying in neighboring states. Um, but since 2015, with the uh, so-called refugee and migrant crisis, uh, Europe, too, has dealt with increasing numbers of refugees, uh, of over 3 million refugees and people in refugee-like situations, including asylum seekers being hosted in the EU 27 member states uh, at the end of last year. Uh, although, like everything, the migration flows have, of course, been affected um, since the start of the pandemic, the past trends suggest that numbers of people seeking harbour in Europe are likely to remain relatively high. Um, so now in this context, and in particular, if we consider the age of refugees coming to Europe, with almost half of the new applicants last year aged between 18 and 34, which is the prime university going age, uh, and further 31% aged less than 18 and thus becoming university aged at some point in the future, access to higher education seems like an important issue to consider uh, in the European context. Now, higher education may not seem a, a priority subject, but we know that access to language training, work and indeed education, including higher education, uh, are all absolutely key to integration of any migrants, and that includes refugees. And I will talk a little bit about the benefits in a moment. But according to the UNHCR, right now only 3% of refugees worldwide have access to higher education opportunities. While this issue has moved on uh, to the global policy agenda in the last few years, 3% is um, certainly not good enough. And indeed, the goal of the UNHCR is to achieve 15% participation by 2030. And to put this into perspective, uh, according to the UNHCR, uh, not UNHCR, I apologize, the UNESCO, uh, almost 39% of young people in the general population in the world and in the EU, 71% access higher education. So we're comparing 3% against 39 or 79, 71 in Europe. Sorry, not quite there yet. Um, so I've had a, a privilege as part of my doctoral research to research the barriers and issues faced by students with refugee backgrounds who aspire to access universities in Europe, uh, in Poland and England specifically. I've spoken to refugees in higher education and those who have not yet been able to enroll, as well as staff in universities and third sector um, who are involved in one way or another in making this a possibility. Uh, and so why is it good to think to offer access to higher education opportunities for students with refugee backgrounds? Um, this is not without caveats, of course. Uh, it must be acknowledged that there are multiple uh, arguments against making university education university available. For example, the, the basic skills shortages in some European countries 
and where they can be linked to channel link of all supports toward uh, higher education access. However, generally speaking, uh, there are numerous benefits of higher education participation. Uh, probably the most obvious and also most widely researched are the individual market benefits to individuals. Those with university degrees in England, Poland, and elsewhere in Europe are significantly more likely to be employed, to be working full time, and to earn more uh, during their lifetimes. Um, but there are other benefits. There is a positive correlation between having experience of higher education participation and the propensity to vote, for example, to volunteer, to participate in public debates and to trust and tolerate others um, in our societies. Graduates are less likely to commit uh, crimes, violent crimes. They live longer, enjoy lower uh, child mortality rates and are less likely to engage in unhealthy behavior. Um, they have better mental health, greater life satisfaction, and better general health. Um, there are tax benefits, uh, and those related to national economic growth and prosperity for the societies with highly educated populations. Um, and there are plenty of benefits of higher education in the context of uh, development, uh, which is relevant because uh, we hope that some refugees will return to their countries and regions uh, of origin. For the sake of time, I'll just um, briefly mention some of the benefits for refugees while they live in their host states. And uh, we must remember that many will remain in their host states for a very long time, a uh, quarter century uh, or permanently. So starting with some uh, market benefits in the UK and other European states, rates of unemployment amongst refugees are much higher than the national average. In the UK uh, in 2019, it was 49% against 27% in the general population. Asylum seekers without recognized uh, status are completely excluded from the labor markets. Uh, although it varies by countries in different European states. In Poland, for example, the exclusion lasts for the first six months, in the UK for 12 months, but then only those with specific skills can request uh, a work permit to work there uh, after that time um, in jobs which have currently shortages uh, of workers. Uh, and those jobs often require a university degree. Um, obtaining a degree and uh, studying uh, is a way out of poverty, but also an opportunity to do something for asylum seekers who are still awaiting a decision on the application, a process which can take several months or in the uh, slowest countries like the United Kingdom, several years even. Uh, research evidence in the past that education leads to emotional healing and lowering of levels of anxiety amongst refugees and provides them with stability and normality by developing a sense of belonging to the institution run by the host community. Um, research shows that participation in higher education programs in particular leads to personal growth uh, and social development and increased confidence. Uh, amongst uh, refugee background students. Um, we know that higher education benefits their families and their local communities, but it also benefits the host society. We know about the reduced, reduced fiscal co uh, costs. We know uh, about uh, higher education facilitating uh, integration with local communities, and it improves the experience for all students at any university. Um, like other disadvantaged groups, students with refugee backgrounds are often motivated to use their education to give something back and choose courses in healthcare, care and education. Um, and there are many uh, more benefits and I could spend an hour just uh, describing those. So uh, let's leave it here. Uh, but I hope that this brief summary uh, of just a few benefits already shows why we should be doing something about this. And now having established the access to higher education for refugee background students is an important and beneficial uh, issue. Um, there are unfortunately uh, 
many barriers that uh, refugee background students face is in accessing higher education. I, I won't be discussing those today, but I refer you to my own work, obviously, and that of many others, in particular in, in Germany from the last few years. Um, but it's important to stress that universities and third sector in Europe are um, making an enormous uh, progress uh, in the support for refugees um, in Europe. Uh, some universities might approach it as part of their internationalization agenda, as suggested by uh, Jana Burke in Germany. Uh, Jana argues that um, framing uh, of refugees should be uh, in terms of the potential, them being potentially highly performing international students um, and a positive enrichment of uh, diverse and international universities. Uh, alternatively, uh, as suggested by uh, some evidence co collected, for example, by uh, Rebecca Murray for in the UK and Sweden, uh, this may be included or seen as fulfillment of universities' duties as part of the existing widening participation agenda, uh, with the bulk of outreach and support done by the widening participation teams in universities and some of the funding coming out uh, of the pots of money set aside for improving university access and participation for disadvantaged and marginalized groups. And widening participation of underrepresented groups, including people with disabilities, ethnic groups, lower socioeconomic status group, and other groups, including migrants, uh, has been increasingly mentioned in European policies, with many countries in the EU and beyond making commitments to develop strategies and define measurable targets um, through the Bologna process, the modernization agenda, and um, the, the successive uh, educational strategies. The quantitative targets uh, set by individual countries often relate just to access and participation, uh, but in some countries they do include targets for completion of higher education programs and finding employment, for example, in, in France and Wales and Scotland. Uh, in my own work, I've argued that universities as institutions can also approach supporting refugee communities, including supporting access to higher education as a matter of their third mission and uh, next to research and teaching um, that of uh, service and social responsibility. Uh, in my work on access to higher education specifically, I also focused on the human rights based approach uh, to higher education and indeed those who work with refugee background students in universities and third sector uh, often frame this um, as uh, frame their work um, as a matter of human rights, um, saying that refugees like everyone else should be able to access universities should they wish to. Um, access to uh, higher education is of course a human right. Uh, as described in, in numerous uh, legal instruments. Um, and the social dimension of higher education is not new, but a growing area of interest in both international and European level policies. Um, indeed, it is important uh, to point out that the issue of higher education for refugee background students specifically uh, has gained some importance in, in political terms in the last few years, uh, at least at the supranational level, with the uh, already mentioned target of 15% participation set by the UNHCR, and the target to be achieved by 2030. And in Europe, the European Commission uh, disseminates successful practices and funds several projects, for example, offering uh, linguistic support to newly arrived migrants, including refugees, and developing toolkits for evaluators to introduce uh, fair and streamlined processes and procedures for recognizes, recognizing um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not feeling very well, for recognizing qualifications held by um, refugees uh, arriving and, and wanting to study in European universities. Uh, unfortunately, although the, the movements to advocate for both those with settled statuses, uh, refugees, those with uh, other statuses like humanitarian protection, and those still awaiting for their decisions, 
Um, uh, those movements have been growing around uh, the world uh, with the, the policies uh, at the supranational level uh, being quite clear. Unfortunately, the policies uh, in most European member states and other European countries have been um, somewhat less satisfactory. Uh, in a 2019 report, uh, Euridice noted that most of countries of the Erasmus Plus program, so more than just the EU member states, um, they do not have specific policy approaches to this matter, despite several systems referring to refugees and or asylum seekers in the national legislation, either referring to um, integration uh, of refugees and asylum seekers or referring to higher education. Uh, the Euridice report suggested that even fewer countries undertake systematic monitoring, uh, confirming that it's still a low priority uh, issue in the national higher education systems. And a little bit more on this uh, in a moment. First, however, it's worth pointing out that uh, while it is uh, difficult to quantify the demand for higher education, among refugees in Europe. Um, my own research and that of several colleagues across Europe and beyond suggest that amongst refugees who have completed secondary level education, there is an almost universal desire to continue education at the university level. My findings suggest that this extends to refugees with uh, different previous educational experiences. So I've spoken to those who already hold degrees from the home states or third countries, and those who have very little formal education, uh, who self-taught and hope to access higher education now that they reached uh, relative safety in Europe. Uh, while we do not have a clear picture at the European level, findings from uh, my doctoral research suggest that in England and Poland, at least uh, in relative terms, considering the general higher education participation rates in both countries, refugee background students can be considered as underrepresented. And some of the limited data uh, available as cited in the Euridice uh, report uh, suggest that the picture is similar in other European states. Uh, well, you might ask why we don't know more. Uh, why do you new universities uh, not uh, monitor access and participation for uh, refugee background students? Um, in uh, several meetings I've had with universities, uh, mostly in UK, I faced comments from uh, some very willing individuals who expressed the preparedness of their institutions to get involved, for example, by providing scholarships, but stressing that senior management will not be persuaded until the clear need uh, is established. Um, when attempting to use data to inform institutional practice and uh, influence national policy, uh, it's paramount that relevant data is in fact available uh, and accurate. And also, although some efforts have been made in different national contexts uh, to map out the participation rates of refugee background students, um, consistent data collection and recording on the applicant students or graduates uh, with refugee backgrounds uh, is generally absent. Um, during the course of my research uh, in England and Poland, I confirmed that there's currently no single data collection instrument for the measurement of data on the applicants or students with refugee backgrounds uh, in either of those countries. And the, the Euridice report suggests that this is uh, the case also in other European countries. Um, while it's not uh, as simple as that, uh, the lack of data can be at least partially explained for the fact that universities are under no duty to record and report such data to regulatory bodies. Uh, as far as I'm aware, in England and Poland at least, there are, has been no effort prior to my own to identify, define, obtain and use the, the relevant data to paint a national picture. Uh, While well in the UK and a few other European countries, we know relatively a lot about the participation rates uh, for different disadvantaged groups. Uh, in Poland and elsewhere, particularly uh, in the eastern part of Europe, um, there's very limited data relating to entrance students and graduates uh, from disadvantaged, um, for example, socioeconomic backgrounds. 
It has been noted by the European Commission before that lack of such data at the institutional and national levels makes it difficult to evaluate the scope of the need uh, and, uh, and the need for student support. Um, several researchers, uh, other than myself, uh, noted that the lack of such data relating to refugee participation in higher education specifically renders refugee background students invisible to the host state's universities. Uh, they don't collect the data, so they don't know how big the problem is. If the problem doesn't appear to be a significant one, uh, there's not necessarily a need to address it. In the absence of the top-down uh, national level requirements to strategically plan for widening participation to those with refugee backgrounds uh, and monitoring of the outcomes for them, um, it can be suggested that data can be collected only at the uh, university level. Uh, it will not be without difficulties as institutions uh, will need to consider both methodological issues and ethical and data protection uh, principles. Um, collection, analysis and dissemination of any migration related de data due to the historical framings around race and ethnicity and the current um, negative attitudes towards migration in many European countries uh, can lead to potential stigmatization and exclusion and they must be carefully considered. There have been some worrying trends in the past uh, in several European trends. Uh, states uh, related to uh, manipulation, selective use uh, and misuse and subsequent misunderstanding of any migration related data, uh, both within the political debates uh, and in the media reports. And that contributed to the development of the current strong discourse around preventing the creation of the so-called uh, pool factors for a migratory influx to Europe. And any such concerns should be weighed carefully before deciding on what data to collect and how to record it. Uh, methodologically, there is an issue of definitions, of course. Uh, you've heard me referring to refugee background students, uh, a term I use for refugees as understood most widely. Um, you'll be aware that refugees are um, is also refugee is also a, a narrow legal term uh, referring to people who have the uh, status recognized under the international uh, laws um, and uh, the issues face um, uh, there are issues related to the recognition of that status and different statuses and rights um, that are linked to the different statuses. Um, asylum seekers are those who have temporary right of stay in the host country uh, until the claim is processed. Um, arguably, their situation is uh, even more precarious than that uh, of those with recognized statuses. Um, in the wider term, uh, understanding of the term refugee, um, asylum seekers are already uh, refugees, whether it has been recognized under international law uh, or not. Um, it matters because uh, those with recogni recognized refugee status are um, under international laws and uh, must not be treated differently from domestic students. Uh, and so while in uh, England and Poland, at least universities are under a legal duty to check evidence of, of uh, this applicant's status to confirm the right to study uh, with no fee in Poland or with home fees level in England. Um, no immigration information is recorded for them in the university record system. So as part of my uh, doctoral research, uh, I mapped out what type of data which institutions uh, have access to, which institutions collect and are able to report on the relevant data, and unfortunately, many of them don't. Uh, While well, some institutions keep copies of documentation on the uh, kind of in a hard copy in the student's uh, file, uh, without checking through all of them, uh, it is not possible for those institutions to um, report on the information on the particular migration statuses of the students. 
Um, despite the issues and the problems in, in obtaining the data, given the potential benefits, um, improvements of outreach and support at institutional level, but also uh, building a body of evidence to influence national and international policies. It seems that moves to introduce and improve data collection uh, on refugee background applicants, students and graduates, uh, at the very least students, uh, is desirable. And to the credit, uh, a growing number of higher education institutions are already collecting or planning to introduce uh, data collection in this area. For some, it doesn't take a lot to be persuaded. So some institutions, once uh, you explain why it might be a, a good idea, uh, don't find it uh, uh, too cumbersome to add another uh, area in the data uh, recording systems. Um, but arguably, <laughs> until refugee students are a returnable public, uh, population uh, under either national or international level, um, we will not have uh, a full and quality assured data. Um, and um, considering some of the issues I've mentioned, for example, around uh, definitions, uh, it would be useful to have some guidance provided uh, on both data capture and collection and the validation and quality checking uh, of relevant data. Um, so uh, going forward, uh, what could be done in the absence of the current national measures? Uh, it seems sensible to me to introduce some data collection and production of indicators uh, at the European level uh, in line uh, with the European level policies. Um, it seems uh, it would be defensible to say uh, the data on access uh, could be measured through conversion rates. So the applicant to student conversion for refugee background students is compared against the wider population. Um, it would be useful to establish with uh, some clarity the demand for higher education among the refugee communities. Uh, information about inclusion of refugee background students in any institutional con contextual admission policies, processes uh, would also be useful uh, indicator of institutional support or access measure um, for this group. Then for convincing institutions to offer support, um, um, many a time I've heard the argument that institutions which rely on success rates of their students in terms of uh, intra-institutional rankings uh, that support uh, those, um, they would say that supporting those with uh, without settled statuses is particularly risky because we don't know if those students will complete their programs. Uh, so data and indicators on completion um, would be useful. And then indicators and data on uh, outcomes for refugee background students compared to those of other graduates or compared to those of other migrants uh, could be useful to uh, help secure public and political supports for higher education for refugees. Um, I believe, unfortunately, that we are uh, still a long way off being able to collect and report on such data. To, so uh, to begin somewhere, uh, perhaps collecting data on enrollment and continued participation uh, measured in comparable way across Europe uh, would be most useful uh, to, to, to start with. So uh, we know that standard measures for higher education participation used in European states differ. Uh, in England, for example, the higher education initial participation rate uh, measures the um, estimated participation of all English domiciled uh, entrants um, by the age of 30. That's based on the current participation of first time entrants. Um, this only refers though to initial, so the first time uh, participation in higher education, not first time entry for each qualification and it's limited to those aged 17 uh, to 30 because data for older students, uh, the data uh, that's needed doesn't go uh, back far enough to calculate it uh, with, with any accuracy. 
Uh, I'll come back to the age uh, in a moment, but it should be noted that uh, the, the precarious nature of lives under the current immigration systems in, mo in most uh, European states uh, means that estimation of projected participation among uh, refugee background students um, is uh, rather uh, inappropriate. The more useful measure uh, would be that uh, of absolute numbers of higher education enrollments, uh, where we want to know about the total current numbers of refugee background students in higher education against the wider student body. Uh, and the first year higher education student enrollments, where we are concerned with access at both institutional and national levels. Um, these measures are available in the UK and Poland too, and uh, a measure of uh, the newly admitted student is uh, available in several countries. I apologize, I did not mean to click on there just yet. Um, it must be noted that the enrollment rates um, used in Poland and England, the, the definitions, the measures don't compare like with like. Uh, and it's also the case with other states. Uh, and this uh, must be checked, of course, as part of any mapping exercise. Uh, but the World Bank and the OECD use different uh, ways of calculating the national gross enrollment uh, rate. They divide the number of students, uh, regardless of age, by the size of uh, population of uh, the age group, which officially corresponds to uh, tertiary education and then multiplying it by uh, 100. Um, but where the data is com we compared internationally, it makes sense uh, to apply uh, measures and definitions used by international um, bodies. However, uh, it's not as simple. Uh, as mentioned, refugee background students often experience long periods of displacement with uh, limited or no access to educational opportunities before arrival in the host country. And so data relating to entrance um, extending beyond 30 years of age uh, is pre preferable. Um, the transient and hard to measure populations like refugee background students, for, for populations like this, uh, it's uh, fairly easy to measure the numerator, but uh, it might be difficult to establish uh, the denominator. Um, it would be preferable, um, but as far as I understand it, it's not currently possible to calculate the refugee background students' representation in higher education as proportion of the relevant aged refugee populations in a European country. Um, the age of new applicants is known for each country on a yearly basis, but it is not possible to establish the current age group of all those uh, living in an European country, uh, having been granted a refugee or other protection status in the past, or those who are still waiting uh, for a decision several years after the application. Uh, in my own research, uh, for comparative purposes to calculate the representation, uh, I've used the number of all refugee background students uh, in the five-year period um, of my study, uh, divided by a total known and reported numbers of refugees and asylum seekers of any age at a time in both countries separately. And this could be calculated on yearly basis um, at a national level with results uh, perhaps published through Euridice, who specialize uh, in comparative analysis of this kind, of course. Um, and I believe the data uh, from HEIs, uh, from institutions, higher education institutions, uh, could be provided uh, at the aggregated level um, by ETER or um, UMultiRank, and uh, more on this in a moment, with data on migration figures available already uh, to Euridice from Eurostat uh, and the UNHCR. Uh, now, at the institutional level, uh, while the participation rates can be compared to the wider student body, it would be difficult, if not impossible, in most places to compare it to any regional numbers of refugees, as um, reliable data is rarely available. In particular, um, when we talk about refugees, as there are no limits on where they may live once the status uh, is granted. 
some countries, of course, keep track of the whereabouts of all their residents, uh, like the Switzerland, as I've learned uh, recently, but this is not common uh, everywhere. It is useful, uh, however, to have the data uh, in terms of uh, participation at institutional level, I believe, for the institutions themselves, so they can plan and deliver appropriate levels of support for applicants and students with refugee backgrounds. And then from policy and research point of view, it is useful to know whether there are differences between particular institutions or types of institutions, for example, and the urban versus rural institutions or between the more research intensive um, resource rich institutions and the more uh, teaching focused, uh, less well resourced um, institutions uh, in terms of the inclusion of students from underrepresented groups. Uh, so in terms of indicators at institutional level, uh, the refugee background students participation rates uh, as a percentage of the whole student body or against this, the particular country's uh, domiciled, domiciled students um, could be perhaps compared to a national uh, average. Uh, and now just a few more words about the potential uh, data collection uh, with ETA uh, and or multi-rank coming to mind because um, both collect uh, data at institutional level in Europe. Um, ETA is a register, a register, a registry of uh, data on uh, tertiary education in Europe, uh, currently covering uh, 34 countries. Uh, most of the data within ATER is supplied by the national statistical authorities in participating country. Uh, so there's precedent for extending data collection through this way, but um, as a matter of principle, ATER data collection doesn't involve any extra or new data collection. Um, and if national authorities are not already collecting relevant data, this may not be possible, but uh, it is uh, perhaps worth exploring on a country by country basis. Uh, and new data sources and data collections are currently being considered uh, as part of the ongoing uh, at a contract and this might include uh, working even more closely uh, than in the past, uh, working together with you multi-rank uh, in the future. Uh, we'll hear more uh, from, from my uh, discussant in a moment. Uh, but multi-rank includes data collection through an online institutional surveys and the self-reported data undergoes careful verification, of course, uh, before it's published. Um, the question for multi-rank may be uh, around relevance as purpose of the project is, is quite different from ETA. The coverage of countries is better uh, in multi-rank with uh, 43 European countries currently included. Uh, Although institution, the, the number of institutions differs with around 1,070, as I last checked, in multi-rank versus uh, around 3,000 in ETA. Uh, but on the other hand, the data in EU multi-rank is not published directly, but instead it's used to call, calculate percentage scores uh, for, um, let's call it performance in different areas. And this would mean that data uh, would be gathered but not made publicly available, which would address some of the ethical concerns around collecting data um, on uh, refugee uh, participation. I don't currently have uh, an answer as to which direction among, uh, I'm sure many other possible might be best. So I will stop here. I'm very much uh, looking forward to hearing from you, friends and uh, anyone else, of course, uh, if we run out of time, I've put on my uh, email address and Twitter account here. So please do get in touch and love to continue this uh, discussion uh, for to, to develop this this uh, area uh, in the future. And thank you again very much to uh, listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Agatha. Uh... That's a central topic of policy interest, and uh, I think you touch upon the challenges we are facing in terms of data collection, and uh, that's why uh, I asked Franz Kaiser to uh, comment uh, since uh, he's worked uh, extensively on data collection on uh, individual institution uh, and is an expert of the topic. Franz, uh, to you the word. 
Thank you very much, uh, Benedetto, and thank you very much, uh, Agatha, for this uh, very interesting talk. Um, and I want to reflect on it uh, based on my experiences with the multi-rank. Let me have a, prepared a few slides. Um, here we are. Yes. Um, well, let me first uh, introduce you to uh, one of the line of work that we're doing at U multi ranks for the last year, which is uh, developing new indicators in uh, for U multi rank. It's indeed at the institutional level, um, and we have uh, a number of strands there on uh, on effective teaching and learning, on uh, education for sustainable development, but we also have a strand for social inclusion, and that is why where I want to focus on. Uh, and we'll have a look whether refugees uh, and refugee students are also popping up in this uh, in these analyses. And then I'll uh, wrap up with uh, a number of questions on relevance and context. Uh, Agatha, you already mentioned quite a few times uh, uh, the context there and the relevance for policy and why should we actually collect information. Uh, and that's uh, what I'm going to address in these questions. Now let's, yes, that's, well, in uh, in this uh, line of work that we do in new multi rank and uh, developing new indicators, um, we didn't start from scratch. We start, of course, uh, from a literature review. Uh, and based on that, we also, uh, in addition to that, actually, we also review the relevant policy documents to see what's already out there in these fields. Um, Policy documents, I mean, I'm not going to list them all, uh, but also existing practices in terms of uh, uh, projects and rankings that are already there. I mean, uh, you know, the Times Higher Impact Ranking, but uh, the Invited Project, which was uh, uh, done two years ago, I think, in, under the realm of EUA, uh, also addressed uh, social uh, inclusion issues. And there are another number of other projects uh, starting up, like, for instance, in the Bologna follow-up group, there's a, a clear uh, project there that is also following up on social inclusion, which is a much broader field, of course, than refugees. And um, based on the findings there, we uh, assembled a list of indicators, um, and we just run them by uh, our stakeholders and experts. Uh, students who are among the stakeholders, uh, where we uh, had a discussion with them on the relevance of the individual indicators, on the validity and on the feasibility. And the re relevance is something that we I'm going to discuss and Agatha has also discussed. The validity is something that uh, Agatha didn't touch that much on in this uh, in her presentation, but the uh, feasibility was something that came, uh, was is actually quite high on the agenda there as well. And I'll say a few words there as well. Um, well, social inclusion, and again, it's it's the more wider uh, context uh, of uh, refugees. Um, as Agatha already said, I mean, it's not all about access. It's all also about progress and 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 success. I mean, it's it's one thing to get people from underrepresented groups in your organization. Uh, sometimes a hard process. But to keep them in and to actually provide them with a degree is, is quite a challenge uh, as well. Um, but we focus on access being the first step in this chain. And since we thought, well, it's already hard enough to get information on that. Uh, another issue uh, when uh, talking about social inclusion um, and finding indicators on it is um, what do you see as, um, um, how to put it, uh, the group that you're addressing um, and the three groups that in the Bologna follower group uh, it's again a group uh, were uh, distinguished that's uh, are the underrepresented groups the disadvantaged and the vulnerable and in the talk that uh, Agatha gave these were kind of used interchangeable um, but there is a difference I mean the underrepresented that is more um, uh, referring to uh, the number of uh, entrants or students compared to a reference population and see whether it has it is underrepresented so the percentage of this group is less than the reference population in the disadvantage there is also a different thing um, because uh, these students actually are faced with a specific challenge 
that other students are not facing. And um, I heard you say that refugee students are also part of this disadvantaged group. And the vulnerable group is uh, a group that is actually at risk of being disadvantaged. So they, they need some special protection um, for that. Um, why is this, this, this difference? Is this, does it matter? I think it's because of the rationale uh, for collecting information on, for instance, refugee students. If your rationale is more on the disadvantaged or vulnerable, or if you see them as belonging to this group, then it's very much on the finding, um, identifying needs of these, group, of these groups, of the refugees, and finding ways of uh, improving their situation. Whereas if you're looking at underrepresented, you see that much more in national and international comparison of um, scores or, or percentages of underrepresented uh, groups in uh, among the uh, new entrants. So there's a different different approach actually, but I'll come, let, come back to that later on. Um, based on, on all this, we uh, actually had a, a number of, of panels like this where we uh, had a list of uh, uh, indicators. And also in the bottom part of this table, you can see a list of um, groups of different terms, types of underrepresented groups. And we didn't distinguish there between uh, uh, disadvantaged or, or vulnerable. But you could see there are a lot of the obvious ones. I mean, gender, age, uh, social economic background, uh, the migrant status, um, the disabilities, that's an also another one, but also refugees, that was also on our list. And the interesting thing there is that the, the experts were quite clear that all these groups, and actually the experts added a few other distinctions there as well, there are, it is relevant to collect information on them, but it's quite difficult to find uh, uh, information on them in terms of feasibility, but also in terms of validity. How can we actually uh, capture uh, um, these characteristics of these groups in, in statistics, in metrics. And as you can see, the multi-ranked team was even more skeptical than the international experts, but that's maybe because we have uh, come across some of the issues uh, during our uh, quite uh, ex uh, old project. Um, so we, we checked with, with our uh, stakeholders uh, the issue on relevance and um, validity, um, but for the feasibility, we also checked with uh, with our participating institutions and asked them whether they actually collect information, collect data on these different groups. And we had refugees there as well, and we limited refugees there as the uh, the ones who had a legal status, so they they were officially recognized as refugee. And I mean, the, the distribution there on, on characteristics isn't very surprising. Gender is uh, collected at almost all institutions. And gender, actually, it's, it's a binary gender. I mean, if you, if you ask for uh, uh, non-binary, then uh, only very few institutions actually collect that kind of information. But that, that's a, uh, aside. Disability is also a very uh, hot issue. And so a lot of institutions collect information on that. But if you look at the refugee status, you can see that uh, uh, only one third of the institution, or one third of the institution, because it's not that uh, poor a situation as you might expect from uh, Agatha's uh, presentation. So one third actually said, well, yes, we are collecting information on that. I mean, we didn't ask for the information in this stage, but they are collecting on information on that. And uh, another, what is it, uh, uh, 10, 15 percent actually did collect information on refugees, but use a different uh, uh, definition. So I guess they are looking at uh, asylum seekers as well, although that was actually a different question. So there is a feasibility issue and especially also a comparability issue, I guess, because that's uh, the thing that we, we will address later on as well. Now, some of, some questions, and I don't want to extend my comments too much. Um, 
That's, I think, uh, one of the things that uh, when, when talking about indicators on new phenomenon, like, uh, well, refugees are not a new phenomenon, but we want to capture this now. Uh, um, first, I start with the question of the why. Why do you want to collect that information? What are you going to do with the information? And who is going to uh, collect it and use that information? And once we've established that, then we can address the, the question, the how. How are we going to collect it and how? what type of indicators can we calculate based on the data elements that we are going to uh, collect. Um, and that's not that obvious in the refugee discussion. Um, first of all, uh, if you're talking about inclusion or, or underrepresentation, I mean, there is a lot of, a, a number of, of um, uh, terms, concepts that are used very often um, um, interchangeable which are not because they are different. I mean, if you're talking about diversity in a diversity discussion, we, we're not talking about uh, measuring the numbers. We just see, well, uh, is, is there a, a lot of diversity or not? Are we seeing different types of students? If you're talking about equality, then we are uh, moving one step further and we're looking at uh, equal opportunities. Do we uh, provide equal opportunities for all types of students? And that's more or less the, the, the framework that you are using, about. Huh? Uh, when you're talking about uh, the the, uh, the 15 percent participation um, uh, target, where you say, well, we need to provide them with with uh, with similar opportunities than the rest of the potential students. Equity is one step further, where you say, well, we have to have some kind of a positive uh, uh, discrimination, some action to uh, uh, actually create an equal situation. Uh, and not only the opportunities, but actually, because the opportunities have to be used by the by the by the refugees. But that is also often a very complicated process that they are not doing this because of cultural or other reasons. So you have to be more active, uh, positive action to create that equity. And the final one that is used now most days is social inclusion. But that's that's again a relatively vague, wide term where this representation is much more part of the of the game. So this this context is quite important. In what what context do you frame the discussion on refugees and their representation? Well, this one we already discussed. Whether you were looking at a different description of the group, um, but it has, uh, as I said, it it has a different impact on what you're going to do with the information. If you're talking about the disadvantaged students or vulnerable ones, you're looking for ways to improve their situation. And, you, and if you're talking about underrepresented groups, then you also can discuss the, the, the issue of uh, monitoring uh, scores, you know, monitor, monitoring percentages, comparing within between institutions, between countries. Uh, and that's not a, a context that where you have this disadvantaged or vulnerable students in. Um, okay. And that's exactly what I, what I had here. So identifying the needs as something that you have with these disadvantage vulnerable. And well, the underrepresented that feeds in more in the, into these uh, other uses of the indicators um, to inform institutional and national policies, which is also, I would say, uh, again, an improvement orientation, or just plainly to assess the performance at, of an institution. Or the national ones. I mean, uh, and but what for what purpose? I mean, that's that's always quite tricky. So, um, different different context means that you have to have also different ways of of evaluating uh, criteria for evaluating the indicators that you propose. Um, and this is my last slide. Um, some issues regarding indicators on refugee status. You already met, uh, proposed a, a number of indicators, or you just mentioned a few. Well, the availability of data is, of course, an issue, as we've seen in our survey, but also from your talk, Agata, you, you already mentioned that uh, availability is a, is a major problem. Um, privacy reasons are obvious. I mean, that's also mentioned by quite a lot of institutions that uh, actually keep them from uh, collecting information on for instance, a uh, refugee status. But the, the main thing, I, I, I guess, is that calculating an indicator that can be used in a comparison, in a comparative way. 
because as you already said i mean it's maybe it's not that difficult to to have information on the on the on the top bar of, of the equation but on the denominator it's quite difficult because what's the reference population that you are going to use um, is it, uh, as you said, the number of ref the refugee students in, this total, in the total student body? Well, maybe it, that is skewed because your institution is in an area where there are virtually no refugee student, uh, refugees uh, located. So, uh, and they're not that mobile. Uh, so uh, does it really uh, uh, capture the performance of your institution? Uh, regarding uh, the take up of refugee students. Uh, and it may also differ by, by region or by, by country that the uh, uh, refugee population itself is quite different. Um, whether they, as you said, I mean, there are a lot of refugees uh, uh, hosted in neighboring countries. Um, but does that have an, uh, a relation with the reasons why they actually fled their country? Is it because of a, an, a, a crisis, a war, or is it a, a different situation where you have a long lasting oppression that certain uh, students actually feel they need to uh, move, uh, move away? Um, and, that has a, and that may have an impact on the composition of that group. Composition based on age, as you said, I mean, they are very young in, in general. Uh, but also on the on the their parental uh, back, uh, the, the educational background of their parents. Some of these, uh, uh, for instance, if you if you look at refugees from Iran, you can see that uh, they most of the time they are very uh, most uh, their parents have a higher education, so they have a higher chance of of, of accessing uh, um, higher education anyway. And but what what is then the the reference population that you're going to use in, in calculating the representation of, oh, I have to move because the, the lights are going uh, uh, out. Um, so um, this, this diversity of the reference population and, and how to use it in an international comparison, that is, I think, one of the major challenges when uh, thinking of um, indicators on refugee students in a, let's say, in a comparative setting. So that means in this um, um, underrepresented uh, setting and not in the uh, setting where you say, well, you, you need to identify the needs. That's, that's a different issue. But if you have it in the comparison setting, as has humility rank and I guess also ITER, then this issue is, I think, the main nut to crack for the uh, years to come. I leave it at this, uh, Benedetto. Uh, if you are interested in the work that we did with you multi rank um, in uh, in this uh, social inclusion uh, indicator uh, development? We have a report that is accessible uh, through the you multi rank website, so you can find it there. But it's uh, that's enough for self promotion. It's about uh, the talk that Agatha gave. Uh, uh, thank you, Franz. Uh, this was a really, uh, useful, important intervention. Especially, I appreciate the idea. It's not just data per se. These indicators, indicators require an agreement, and the agreement is related to some uh, institutional goals. So what you want to measure and what we are lacking is not just that we are missing data on refugees. We are maybe unclear on what we want to measure as policy indicators on that. So, but at the same time, the work on data contributes to highlighting options for, for indicators. So there is a, an interrelationship. I would like to open the floor for a round of questions and then to give back the word to Agatha for answering. So who wants to ask questions? And please, when you ask questions, or open your micro, open your camera, and maybe present shortly yourself, which will help us uh, interact even online. Questions? Uh, maybe Benedetto, I can uh, jump in. Uh, hi everyone, Jean-Patrick Villeneuve. Uh, I'm based at the Università della Svizzera Italiana. Well, it sounds so much better in Italian than, than in English. And I had a question. I work from, I come from this whole discussion from the point of view of public administration, uh, public governance aspect. And a question for Agatha, I thought it was quite interesting initially, not myself, not being an expert, 
in your topic, you underlined a lot of the top benefits of having refugees in higher education, a series of arguments, and it all makes sense. I was just curious, in terms of the academic discussion on the topic, do we find across the aisle, beyond the, we don't like refugees, uh, we want to get them out, um, is there a certain level of uh, discussion on um, not so much the downsides. We have some of the downsides of this. Should we, for refugees, focus on our education or is there part of discussion that says no trade school? We're in Switzerland where there's a lot of non-higher education uh, approaches. So uh, what's the discussion like in the field? Or does everybody agree this is a great idea, let's go forward? Thank you, Jean-Patrick. I think it's a relevant question because there was some implicit assumption in the whole discussion we are looking now that it's, uh, we need to push uh, refugees to higher education. And uh, I think it's, it's good to critically question. Other questions? So otherwise, I will first give back the word to Agatha and then maybe ask you. In the meantime, you can prepare additional questions. Thank I you. Thank you, Benedetto. Uh, thank you, jean -Pierre. Uh um, Well, in the higher education literature, <laughs> uh, where the agreement on benefits of higher education for the different groups, for the society at large, uh, you know, there there is a, a certain consensus on a, on um, higher education access to higher education, equal opportunities, um, being a good thing, <laughs> and everyone who uh, wants to being supported to make it to higher education. So, um, in in other literature on uh, integration uh, of refugees. Uh, this issue also comes up um, as part of a broader of education, um, uh, access to education in general. There are uh, there is a big body of literature on access to education at the primary and secondary levels. Um, a lot of this literature is focused on uh, the pipeline, and if there are no higher education opportunities. How do we um, make it worthwhile uh, for young people, uh, children, and then young people to want to stay uh, in uh, and, and do well in the lower levels of education? And this is for uh, everyone. Obviously, it doesn't just refer uh, to, to forced migrants, but, but the literature on um, educational opportunities for refugees talks about specifically this being a, 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 the, the blocked pipeline being uh, an issue. So there is, a, a, in higher education literature, there is a, a, a certain level of, of consensus that the, it, it is a, a good thing and that it should be supported, it will benefit not just the refugee students, but in general, the student body. So uh, if we want to have internationalized uh, international universities, and then that involves including refugees who are international students, and uh, they fall into more groups. They not only uh, um, migrants, but they also uh, often overlap with the, the other underrepresented or or disadvantaged or marginalized groups. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I, I have not yet come across uh, literature suggesting that we should focus on, on other areas uh, first. Uh, it's more um, some of the policy work, all the policy work on um, integration that focuses on vocational uh, training. Um, my experience with um, the institutions which are supposed to be supporting integration, uh, they definitely focus on getting refugees into work, uh, whatever their uh, backgrounds, uh, whatever their uh, potential, uh, it's about uh, getting people 
into work. And so in my work, I've, I've interviewed refugees with PhDs uh, who were told to, you know, just go and clean instead of uh, getting the uh, documents um, approved in, in the new country. Um, so there is, in, in terms of literature, there's a, a consensus, it's a good thing. It's something that we should definitely look at and support. Um, in the international or European level policies, uh, higher education is also seen, uh, seen as part of the uh, integration uh, agenda at national level and uh, specifically what the institutions um, meant to be integrating um, forced migrants, uh, th 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 there is a, a difference there. I hope that answers your clear question. No, no, thanks. I think it's interesting to see what academia says, what policy sector says, and the integration of the field in a broader, in a broader discussion. Thanks. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a question, and I'm I'm yes. sorry I'm speaking without raising my hand. I can't find the raise hand on the Zoom. It's like the news to no settle the Zooms. Okay, my name is Yolanta Grzebiecka, and uh, Dzień dobry, Agata. <laughs> Um, I am a professor here at Università della Svizzera Italiana. I also like the, the English version of the title. And uh, my uh, doctoral student, Agata Sarek, is also here. And together we have a, a, a project on uh, uh, refugees, specifically Eritrean refugees in, in uh, Switzerland, funded by the Swiss National Science Foundation. But it's not about the project. Um, I wanted to ask Agata about her work and uh, especially what interests me is this uh, notion of the block uh, blocked pipeline and uh, the way in which suddenly here in, in Switzerland, while there's very strong sort of professional uh, education here, um, indeed a lot of uh, refugees are channeled uh, there, even, even though there are actually specific barriers to that as well. Uh, because of the age uh, limit on apprenticeships and, and other kinds of things. But I wanted to, to, to know if, um, because, you know, from what I understand, like in Poland, it has to do getting into the university, has to do with matura, and, uh, you know, there are the O levels, A levels, etc. In the in the UK. And when you're dealing with the refugees, they might not have the, the required um, uh, background and, and not have these uh, these tests. And so I just wanted to know what is being done, perhaps at the policy level, to change and address uh, and address these these issues so that um, these barriers are removed. And uh, whether you have found whether the specific background of uh, refugees uh, uh, matters. So for example, in, in Poland, um, uh, Ukrainians are considered, uh, you know, refugees and, and whether that puts them, you know, for ex as an example, in a kind of a, a different category in terms of uh, access, et cetera, as opposed to, for example, refugees from, uh, from the Middle East. So thank you. And, and, and I also wanted to say thank you about so the great presentation. So thanks. Thank you. Uh, there is a question also by Marina. So Hello everyone, and uh, thank you very much for two very interesting presentations. Uh, my name is Marina. I'm uh, from Central European University in Vienna, from Yehuda Elkana Center for Higher Education, more precisely. And uh, my question would be maybe, uh, I heard that you talked a lot about higher education institutions and how they do it. But from my experience previously with, uh, for instance, DID in Germany or um, some other programs um, I've read about or experienced, that uh, sometimes um, this is the external actor uh, that actually helps refugees uh, to fulfill their educational ambitions. So have you looked maybe at um, the external actors that are say tuning scholarship uh, program in the UK or similar organization in Poland and maybe to see to what extent do this uh, major organizations in the country actually do pay attention to refugees, what kind of programs are there? And um, also would be interesting to know uh, whether they actually concentrate on those who are already in the country or they invite uh, refugees from abroad. 
for example, um, I know from the DAD um, in Germany, they did um, an amazing work when they were inviting people from Syria who were already enrolled in higher education and helping them to transfer um, the German higher education context. And um, this could be also interesting to look at how these external organizations uh, help to shape the um, refugee integration in higher education. Um, Thank you. Are there other questions? Otherwise, I'll give back the word to Agatha for a rejoinder. Thank you. I've tried to make a couple of quick notes, uh, like quite different questions. Um, so in terms of, um, to answer your, your question, uh, uh, Yolanta, um, the, 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 the right to access higher education should be, according to international laws, be uh, assessed based on all relevant uh, information and, and uh, experience not based on whether somebody has or doesn't have a level uh, a level certificate and we do have experience of contextual admissions um in uh, all over uh, i think uh, us is is particularly uh, uh good uh, the uk is uh, trying um uh, we have experience in not requiring uh, such documentation, for example, from mature students, so whether there has been a, a large gap in educational histories, um, people, uh, uh, mature students are uh, supporting into access programs or, or different, um, um, through different routes uh, to access higher education if they want to. So we kind of, we know how to do it, uh, but the same, rules are not from uh, what, what what i've observed the same rules are not applied to uh forced migrants uh partially there is uh, still an issue of a lack of understanding um uh, in particular in countries where like the uk uh where the universities uh are um, very reliant on decisions made in the in the home office, the immigration uh, body who regulates who can and cannot have in international students, uh, and them not wanting to uh, break any rules because of the consequences that it it may have. Uh, so the lack of understanding of of uh, relevant uh, legislation and uh, and rules in universities. Uh, is, is still a problem. Um, but there are some moves. So the European uh, Commission produced together with um, NARIC, which is a, a, a UK body for comparing um, previous uh, or, or levels of uh, educational qualifications. They prepared uh, a guide, and this is now being uh, or you, countries in Europe and but also in the United States and Canada, I think, are being encouraged to to use this to recognize uh, previous qualifications. Unfortunately, it mostly relates obviously to formal qualifications. Um, but uh, as uh, as far as it is legally possible, uh, and it will different in different national contexts. Um, but universities are often actually within the, the national rules, able to assess the applicants on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, so they can forfeit the required, they don't need the, the A-levels results if they can interview someone and assess their um, capacity uh, to study. Obviously, it's not all just about access to higher education, as Franz uh, also discussed. It's about uh, making sure that people can uh, get in, but they also need to be supported once they're there so that they succeed in these studies. Um, setting up, uh, setting people up for failure is not uh, uh, not a positive, and, and it shouldn't shouldn't be a goal. Um, and and several universities in Europe, and this here I can link to, to uh, your point, Marina, 
together with third sector organizations are working uh, to either provide um, specific uh, access uh, programs or programs which uh, equip are meant to equip uh, refugees with uh, the skills necessary to succeed in these studies once they actually um, get in. Um, in the UK, um, the most support is actually provided by the universities themselves. There are several uh, institutions that support them as well. Uh, the um, Refugee Council uh, in the UK, but also uh, Cities of Sanctuary Movement, uh, which is kind of a top, uh, a bottom-up uh, movement that um, involves all different areas, but there's uh, also a branch uh, called uh, Universities of Sanctuary, and then um, so universities can get you know, universities like little uh, stamps that they can add on their websites to say that they are doing something well. Uh, and uh, so it get having some data to support that they are doing well, that they are getting um, enough applicants and they are accepting and uh, they are able to support enough students with refugee backgrounds. Uh, it's helpful to them. Uh, in other European countries, there are also some uh, great movements. There's the Kiran um, online university, which works with universities all over the world, uh, with uh, refugee students accessing first part of their program fully online and then completing it in the awarding institution uh, in person. Um, the, those programs, uh, so the programs supported by the universities themselves are mostly for people who are already there. So it's obviously the, the, the smaller percentage of the, in relative terms, slacky people who, who made it to, to safety uh, already. Uh, and that was kind of my, my focus uh, to date. There are obviously a lot of European universities that are doing their part also supporting um, institutions in countries like Turkey, for example, developing their capacity to support the huge amount, obviously, of uh, Syrian, mostly Syrian refugees there in, in um, designing programs specifically uh, for them. Uh, but there are uh, other, uh, the, the issue here is a, a legal one in, in a lot of cases. So in Canada, for example, countries, uh, private sponsors, uh, can bring people in. Um, in uh, a lot of European countries, there's just no um, no way to do it uh, in, uh, in legal terms. Uh, although UK, the first King's College is the first university uh, in the UK that became a private sponsor, bringing um, refugees from outside through the special uh, settlement program. So there, there, yes, there is a lot of good going on. It's just that at the moment, it's uh, unfortunately on a very, still very limited scale, considering the potential need, as as I've mentioned. Um, I, I hope it answers your questions. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a little bit under the weather, so uh, I'm not sure if I'm still making sense. <laughs> No, no, thank you. Thanks, Agata. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Agata. Thank you. Um, Benedetto has another uh, um, meeting right now. So uh, any other reaction from the floor? Uh, can I ask okay. a question? <laughs> okay, <laughs> you're welcome. Yes, okay, thank please. you. My name is Agata. I'm doing my PhD with Professor Yolanta in uh, uh, in Lugano. So I am a refugee student myself with a refugee background. So uh, based on my own experience and the experience that I see uh, from other Eritrean refugees in Switzerland who want to continue pursue their higher education, one of the, the main problem is finance. So my question is how far or to what extent do universities support refugees to have access or to continue their education? Because 
if they don't go if they don't get this financial assistance from the universities depending on which content they leave they they will be unable to continue uh, their studies even if they get the admission thank you yes i mean finance obviously in in the countries where where you there are tuition fees i mean i'm i'm all for free higher education uh, for all uh, as the human rights also ask for progressively free higher education. Unfortunately, we seem to be going the other way uh, in most uh, places. Finance is a big issue, uh, particularly so for, uh, I'd say, for people who do not yet have settled statuses, who cannot access any forms of support uh, like scholarships or um, student loans in the countries that uh, have them. Um, universities are doing a little bit better. Uh, a part of the question is which money can they use and whether they can use monies, uh, pots of money that they have put aside for widening participation or supporting uh, uh, disadvantaged students, whether they can legitimately use them for um, students with refugee backgrounds and um in the uk again <laughs> i apologize that's that's uh, i've i've been uh, in that system for for a long time so i i, I know most about uh, about that system um since the introduction of uh, refugees in the uh, office for students guidelines on on disadvantaged groups universities have definitely um been spending more money on supporting uh, refugee background students. So there's, um, because widening participation is uh, a huge agenda, a policy agenda item in the UK, universities spend a lot of money. They have big budgets uh, for this. Since they uh, can now use some of that money to support uh, access and, and continued participation for refugee students, they are doing more. Um, there are private bodies that support uh, refugee background students. Uh, as students don't necessarily know about them. Uh, so I see it also as part of the university's role uh, to inform the students uh, on where to seek uh, additional support. Um, but yes, the, the, the money problem, although just one of uh, hundreds of, of barriers faced by refugees, the, the, the financial issue uh, is a huge one. Uh, but just to give an example of my own university where I did my PhD, that the budget for widening participation was 10 million pounds a year, you know, the scholarship for uh, one to support one student where you can uh, provide them a free accommodation because the university owns some of the accommodation the, the, you waive the fees, even though there are tuition fees, the universities can just waive them. The cost to university is really just uh, the, um, a, a small scholarship to support the living costs uh, of, of the refugees uh, students. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm quite pragmatic. Uh, I'm a little bit cynical maybe about uh, the choices that universities make and what is trendy and what will make them uh, look good and what will make them appear in, in media reports. Um, but universities are doing a little bit better. Thank you. And we can continue. Um, since you probably not very not sound very far from me, we can continue <laughs> this conversation on another day as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I take the opportunity to remind you that all the material presentation of Agatha will be available on our RISIS website, the Node platform, and I will send you an email uh, with the link. And uh, now, any other reaction from the floor? I would remind you also our next research seminar, Institutional versus 
regional attractiveness, what factors are more important to increase the pool of mobility of, uh, in the tertiary education?